Hello, it is Ed Butowski with ChapwoodFinance.com. And for those of you new to our site, one of the number one goals of ChapwoodFinance.com is to really bring knowledge and perspective to the investment world and what's going on in the world economy. And today I'm honored to have a gentleman who I've known for 20 plus years, a professor and Dr. Paul Tiffany from the Cal Berkeley uh, Haas School of Business. And, and Paul, your expertise is really you know, really the, the global economy, and that's really your expertise in terms of management as well as, you know, management structure and business in the United States. Um, and I just got to tell you, I'm just so honored to have you here today. So thanks for joining us. Happy to be here, Ed. And now what I'd like to jump into right away is you have spent a lot of time in China. I think you, you actually taught over, is it Shanghai or Beijing? Shanghai. And, and, and many people in the United States today are wondering about the world economy and that, that animal out there called China, which is the second largest economy in the world. Um, so I'd like to have you touch on what is good going on there and what are the things we need to watch out for? Because some people are telling us China is a little bit of a myth. So could you touch on that a little bit? Sure. Um, and I, I think the premise is definitely correct. That's the big elephant out there these days. There are Jim O'Neill's bricks, and China is one of those, but China dwarfs everything else. Uh, India has slowed down substantially. Russia never should have been on the list. And Brazil is a classic. Brazil is a country of the future. Pause. And it always will be. Right. The difficulty in getting it together. China, you know, as we understand it today, is a phenomenon really of about the last 10 to 12 years. Um, in 1978, 1979, uh, Mao died in 76, the so-called Gang of Four, mucked about for several years, uh, not knowing what to do. And finally, in uh, 1978, turned to uh, a man named Deng Xiaoping, who really created the modern China. Mao was a revolutionary, but Deng Xiaoping was a guy who said uh, one of his most famous quotes, to be rich is wonderful. And he created the so-called um, capitalism with the socialist face, capitalism with socialist characteristics. He, um, he was instrumental in getting the economy moving. Uh, the timing, as you know, you're in finance, timing is everything. Late 70s, early 80s, the Japanese are pounding on the door everywhere. How can uh, Western firms compete? And Deng Xiaoping <clears throat> created these same things called SEZ, Special Economic Zones. And the first was in Shenzhen. Shenzhen is at the tip of the uh, Pearl River Delta close to Hong Kong. And he said if Western firms come in there, they must bring capital, they must bring technology, bring money. Uh, <clears throat> they can set up shop, access our incredibly low-cost labor, zero taxes for the first five years, maximum 15% after that. At the time, Ed, the tax rate in China on business profit was 85%. So this proved to be a huge lure for Western firms. And that experiment, just from the get-go, it just took off. Firms poured in there. And they began to, China began to proliferate these so-called SEZ, Special Economic Zones. Well, that, for 20 years, it was kind of China below the radar, creating that infrastructure, <clears throat> Western firms coming in, uh, nobody making money. You know, go back to early to mid-90s, I'm sure you remember that. The net was coming. The Internet was a big, big thing, but nobody knew how to make money. They thought, God, I've got to be there, but how do you monetize this? China had the same reputation. You had to be in China. The massive population, it was the market of the future. But how do you make money? So there was trepidation. There was worry about how do you deal in this environment. And it took some time. <clears throat> and Deng Xiaoping uh, stepped down in around 1991. <clears throat> and his uh, a successor, um, he pushed things forward. He tried to open up uh, a little more. A guy named Jing Jimen, who had been mayor of Shanghai. And he pushed forward the continuing infrastructural development. <clears throat> and it was, a, it was based on an export-led economy, uh, controlling the RMB, the uh, currency, which is not uh, a convertible currency. It still can't be traded uh, in rural markets. Well, it, it worked. Uh, they began to export a lot, cheap uh, labor, cheap products, everybody flocking over there. 
uh, I will give China some credit. The, if you're elected to the presidency by uh, the uh, Politburo, you have a five-year term, you're re-elected for five years, and then you're out. This is not Russia with Putin or some other countries where the uh, uh, Chavez in Venezuela, the late Chavez, where they overstay their welcome, where they skew the process so they can stay until they die. <clears throat> well, uh, he left uh, uh, Jiang Zemin after 10 years. And then the, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the current president who served until literally last uh, uh, Thursday, uh, Hu Jintao, it was his turn. Hu Jintao was a very gray sort of character, a bureaucrat, no, nothing more, but he kept the ball rolling as well. His uh, second tenure term ended last November. They anointed the new guy, Xi Jinping, and last Thursday he took office. He's the president the first time since Deng Xiaoping. He also is running the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. So he's the military leader and the party leader. Something um, your viewers should keep in mind. Um, it's interesting, if you ever look at the flag of China, that's not the flag of China. China doesn't exist. It's the flag of the Communist Party. The party says, we are China. Everything in this ground that's demarcated as China belongs to the party. And the current, they, they've done, let, let's give them credit, the stewardship, the growth, all these other things. We're aware of these gaudy statistics of uh, uh, per capita GDP going up, uh, <clears throat> overall GDP, as you pointed out in your uh, intro, they are now the world's second largest economy. Fourth quarter of 2010, they overtook Japan. In, uh, in purchasing power parity terms, China's GDP today is almost $13 trillion. We are, since nominal dollars, we are $15.9 trillion. <clears throat> IMF says in 2016, China will be ahead of us. Others have said it's going to be earlier because China will devalue, or pardon me, revalue uh, the currency to reflect greater value that will drive up the volume of their trade, and the U.S. will probably devalue the dollar. So maybe some have said it could occur in 2013. So clearly it's growing, it's good for the global economy, the slowdown, etc. <clears throat> but and as you pointed out, I take a longer view on things. You know, it's not, you know, what did the... Dow Jones do today. That's right. the, your investors have to look at that. But those are simply empirical results. The, those are data points. The question, where do those data points come from? What causes the market and the numbers to do what they do now? <clears throat> and China and the United States uh, are going to have problems ahead. As China continues to build up, as they expand uh, their economy, <clears throat> Of the many major differences between the United States and China, one of the most striking is the um, almost total lack of natural resources, raw materials within China itself. In the whole, yeah. in the whole country of China, because I'm actually They're, going to China uh, this <clears throat> summer for the first time. I've been looking at the map. I mean, all I see is a lot of empty space. So there's not a lot of natural resources in China. <clears throat> And we are lucky, and we're blessed. We have, I mean, everywhere. We are the almost within the geographic area, the richest concentration of almost anything you want. Not only fertile soil, uh, fossil fuel, uranium, gold, silver, uh, uh, copper, name it. We've got it. Okay. Right. Part of China's uh, uh, go, uh, go forward strategy, they've got to ensure a constant flow of raw materials. Mm -hmm. That drives much of China's participation in the global economy. China claims we are not an imperialist nation. The peaceful rise of China is the term that they always talk about. But I'm sure your uh, uh, listeners, your viewers, are aware that all these problems popping up, the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea, the Daichai Islands south of Japan, problems in Tibet, problems in uh, uh, the uh, lower Mongolian Peninsula, problems in the Stans in the far west of China, Every single one of those problems is a resource play. China is pushing out to control uh, natural resources. And in fact, it includes North Korea, too. Uh, China claims that co the Korean Peninsula is really Chinese, that the ethnic origin, they're all Chinese. They started making that claim uh, four or five years ago when the last Kim Il-jung, the lunatic uh, uh, guy in North Korea, <laughs> there was uh, worries that he was going to collapse. And China was putting out a marker. When he goes, 
you ain't getting it South Korea or the U.S. We're getting it because they're really Chinese. And the Koreans, of course, way, way back, there's some ethnic lineage, but they don't buy that. So part of China's uh, issue now, they want to lock up raw materials. Uh, another aspect that ties into this, China has the fastest growing military in the world in terms of percentage of uh, budget increase. Uh, by far, it grows at double digit. This year, uh, 14 percent was the budget. <clears throat> well, if it's a peaceful rise of China, why right. are they building up the military, which is a legitimate question. Uh, one uh, response that many have made, Taiwan. Taiwan was, is, and will always be a part of China, end of story, in their uh, view. And there's no uh, uh, questioning that. Taiwan is coming back to China. So many have said, well, this buildup is to project power. Look, Taiwan, I don't care how many jets uh, the U.S. gives you, you're never going to be free. So that's one. Eh, maybe. A better answer is that many of you are aware, I'm sure you are, China got its first aircraft carrier. Because a lot of the, the real buildup has been in, naval, uh, uh, in the naval area. And a lot of it was landing craft, and everybody said, yeah, Taiwan, or uh, whatever. But they're now building a blue water navy, a deep navy. Why would they do that? Conspiratorialists, ah, the coming Armageddon with the U.S. A better answer, who maintains the sea lanes of the world? The United States Navy does. We are the ones that keep sea lanes open for world commerce. And China is saying, do we want to be dependent on the U.S. Navy to keep our economy going? So they're beginning to build up, acquire bases, get contracts for bases in strategic points in the world. So as their Navy, they built this first carrier, they're building other stuff, so that they can maintain a flow. This is one issue, again, that uh, I think has to be thought of as the U.S. and China goes forward. They are extremely worried about the ability of an outsider, the foreign devils, as we're known, right. to cut off the access of China's necessary access to raw materials, which constantly fuel economic growth. Well, let, so me, that's, let, let me ask you this, Paul, because um, as we, you know, in the United States, we talk about our debt, and we talk that China owns so much of our debt. I mean, you know, you're, you, you, there's probably very few people in the world that understand China better than, than you do. What do you think? Do you think there's a play there where at some point they just stop buying our debt and throw us into economic and, and military chaos? They could. At this point, even with their growth, the relative strength vis-a-vis -vis the United States military is just not there. I mean, we are so far ahead, but it is growing. But they could do that. I think I, I would point to your viewers in this thing, an issue. <clears throat> As we know, that the U.K. was the 19th century. They don't move. Into the 20th century, <clears throat> the uh, uh, British economy peaked, literally peaked, the peak was 1877, and it slowly came down. But much of the first half of the 20th century, they were still the residual world power that dominated global politics. They ran the system. We had emerged as the largest industrial production power, but we never, we being the U.S., never exercised the political might that goes with that. And that has to do with a lot of historical reasons. America being a very isolated, inward-looking nation for much of its history. At the end of World War II, the UK was dead. This was where, at the Bretton Woods Agreement, 1944, the dollar, the US dollar, replaced pound sterling's global reserve currency. And the US, as the uh, Cold War set in, we, the US, created all, all these modern instruments to manage the world economy. The World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, NATO, the BISF, all these things, because we wanted to contain uh, Russia. Okay. The Brits went along, but it was like, well, the Americans are going to do this stuff. But you know, we're the Brits. We created that. They were all over the world. The tipping point was 1956, the Suez Crisis, Nasser in Egypt. And the Brits and France and Israel had a deal amongst themselves how to deal with Nasser. We, the U.S., was not involved. John Foster Dulles, who was the Secretary of State for Eisenhower, he calls up the Brits and said, remember those loans, the war, you owe us? We're calling the loans immediately if you don't back off this. We, the U.S., will talk and decide what to do. The Brits were dumbfounded. And it's where they said, my God, they're the banker. They can tell us what to do. Right. And it was 1956 where it finally dawned on the U.K., you don't run the world. 
the United States runs the world because they've got you by well, they've got you by the treasury. Yep. And that context is set in. Now, I, I point that out as we are beholden. The much most of the uh, uh, foreign debt that the U.S. has is not external; it's internal to our own banks and our own citizens. Yes. But out of the foreign debt, Japan is still number one of buy because they buy our T bills. But China is rapidly becoming number two. China is sitting on three point six trillion dollars in foreign exchange, foreign reserve. Yes. Is there? Uh, so you tell me that they have three point six trillion of our debt? Yeah, no, of overall foreign reserves. No nation has ever had any. It used to be literally if a nation had a hundred billion in foreign reserves in their treasury, God, they're just overwhelming. China has three point six trillion dollars. So, so, part, so I want to yeah, make this ahead. point very clear. Three point six trillion, meaning that they just have that in like free cash in their yeah, country. Yeah, it's like Apple sitting on a hundred billion now. In dollars in the treasury, China is sitting on that, and, the, and the United no, States on the flip side, we are 17 trillion in the hole. In the hole, yeah, yes. I mean that's an interesting comparison. Now, the um, uh, when, when you put that out there, <clears throat> part of it has been for strategic reasons why China builds it up. China's economic policy, as they built the infrastructure, as I pointed out before, the policy in the last 10 years has been an export-led economy. 45% of GDP of China's economy comes from exports. What drives the G uh, GDP in the United States? Personal consumption. Personal consumption, it averaged about 67% of GDP from the 50s on. After 2000, after the recovery from 9-11, it spiked up to 72%. We're pigs at the trout. The major other European nations the amount of personal consumption that goes into GDP is 50 to 60 percent. We were way ahead. In China, it's recently gotten up to 33 percent. It was in the 20s. There's not a lot of personal consumption. It's this classic case, rich China, roughly speaking, poor Chinese. But they've pushed it so far, they know they've got to change. The currency, as I pointed out, is not <clears throat> convertible. They make stuff, right? We buy it because the prices are cheap, uh, because they control it. Eighty percent of what Walmart sells in the United States, uh, Walmart and Exxon go back and forth, is top-line revenue, biggest firm in the world. Eighty percent is made in China. You go to Walmart, you look around, their prices are good, you buy the stuff. Right. Okay, money gets to China. What they do with it, though, a lot of it, they buy our U.S. debt because it's a way of sanitizing. If it stayed, it would drive up the currency. They don't want their currency to be driven up, so they get it out of the system. So they're sitting on tons of our paper. But there's, and there's two sides to that. It gives them leverage. But on the other hand, if we wanted to, what's our, what can we play? Devalue the dollar. We cut the value of their reserve. And there's a two-side edge to this. They're sitting on a huge amount, over well over a trillion dollars. If we devalue, they're not going to be happy for right. obvious reasons. Right, but if we devalue our currency, and, and I just wrote an article on this, and tell me if it was, you know, tell me if what I wrote was right. Uh, but I just wrote an article that when we devalue, when we print money and devalue our currency, it makes the prices go up because it costs us more to buy things because we, we consume about 70% of what we consume we get from outside the United States. Yeah, well, if we, it makes our, and many, especially China, have argued that the U.S. is artificially keeping our currency low to stimulate exports. Um, there is some of that, but we buy a lot. And there's another factor. What's our biggest import? It's finally changing oil. Right. Oil is denominated in dollars. So when you cut the value of the dollar, it doesn't help us in terms of cheaper oil prices because they just value it on. And, and, do, and oil prices go up. So. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah. So, 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 Paul, what I want to do is because we could talk all day, and, and right. believe me, I'm going to be calling you a lot because this is fantastic. And um, but when we look at this from from an investor standpoint, we hear about China, we hear about the fear of them owning you know, our debt. I did not know that Japan owned more of our debt than China. I thought China did, but regardless, either way, China has a huge amount of our debt, and and right. that is a big concern. From the standpoint of investing in China, many people want to you know, go to where that growth is. 
But at the same time, we hear a lot of inflationary pressures. And you said it you, you said it a second ago that a lot of wealth is in very few people's hands. So there's a lot of people there that have not really uh, developed a, a great economic picture because it's very <clears throat> sparse. Is, is that true? Yeah, okay, two issues. Okay. One word to any of your listeners who want to invest actually in China, in equities there. No. You don't have a clue of, of what you're getting. There's no transparency. That's the problem. Okay. You don't know what you're getting. There, there is on paper comparable SECs, things like that, but they're on paper. There is so much insiderism. I mean, look what happened. What's in the news this morning? SunTech uh, uh, went bankrupt, you know, which is the world's biggest maker of, um, <clears throat> of solar panels. ADRs are domiciled. They're traded on uh, NYSE. Right. But they went bankrupt. Nobody, there, there were some worries. Nobody knows this because you can't get data. So it's really, as some of your southern uh, uh, viewers might watch, a pig and a pope. You don't know what you're getting. Yes. Okay, that's one thing. Secondly, the market can be manipulated, and it is. Shanghai index is really down now. Average PE has come down to like 13 or 14, and maybe that's good. Average PE on the NYSE is still about 20. But the average PE Shanghai five years ago was almost 100. What's happened now, though, what's replaced the equity bubble? The housing bubble. Okay, now listen to this word. I, this is not a typo in my part. 65 million unoccupied housing units in China today. 65 million unoccupied housing units. Because China saw that we're making money. Many don't want to put it in the bank because they don't, it, it becomes known. Government itself. By the way, time out of it. A lot of publicly traded firms, of, of Chinese firms have gone public. No matter what you buy, Get an annual report. Here's the CEO, EVP, senior VP, something you never see in those Chinese firms. There's another secret hierarchy called the Communist Party. Every single firm has a shadow a, a government in governance inside, capped at a guy who is equal to the CEO. Nothing can be done of substance unless the party guy approves. Price changes growth, acquisitions, etc. You don't know that, but it's there. Any of these firms, a Chinese firm, have that. Well, we don't know what's going on, but a lot of uh, in people with money, they're making money, they don't want to put it into the bank. They're fearful others will see it. So it's gone into property. And not convertible currency, you can't get it out. Right. So there's a massive bubble. When I taught there, a lot of these students, um, it was the biggest executive MBA program in the world. There were a lot of party members in it. I remember it was just not uncommon at all for some of these students. They've got five houses. They've got ten houses. Many of them, they buy on cash. They get their friends. They put money in. So it's like a bank account. The market was going up. They were right. making tons of money if you sold. Underneath, underlying, the demand is there. There are about 800 million workers in China. And the China we read about is really along the eastern seaboard. In the western agrarian provinces, there's huge demand to get out of poverty and to get housing. At some point, they're absorbed. But how long can you hold on? And you probably saw many of your uh, uh, viewers two weeks ago in 60 Minutes, the ghost cities, ghost malls, towns that were built to accommodate 50 or 100,000 people. Empty, completely empty. Condos, roads, malls, nothing. Not a single person there because the money poured in. And then the government just recently, a month ago, said we're going to try to stop this. If you have a other than your primary residence, if you sell, you have to pay a 20% tax. There are laws, but they aren't enforced well because the further you get from Beijing, enforcement is very weak. Well, that, so there's underlying worries about it. There's a problem there. Well, that, that is really good information. I remember that old movie, uh, Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. Well, here, build a city and maybe they'll show up. Uh, there are but 60, over a hundred ghost cities. Six, over a hundred ghost cities. Nobody living there, and right. sixty-five million. There are only there are about two hundred twenty million housing units. There are three hundred eighty-five million households in China. About two hundred twenty million homes. Sixty-five million are on. These are on spec. People, you know, hoping it's there. So there, there's worry. We don't want China to go under. Right. We, you, me, your viewers, investors. But we don't want China saying we'll play by our rules. We need to work this out, and it's a tough issue. My only advice then for your viewers going forward, you've got to be very careful. Hedge anything you do in China. 
And the one that you know, you might have been the first one to tell me about this. You look at MNCs like GE, who do a lot of work there. That's one way to get the upside without all the eggs for right. downside crash. It's funny you remember that because years and years yeah. ago we had a discussion and uh, we called them GlowCal. They were uh, global companies, you know, domestic companies doing business outside the U.S. And as uh, Dr. Marston, your old uh, colleague at Wharton, uh, talked about, was if you want to, you know, those markets will move up and down with the country where they're domiciled. So if you want to get exposure to those, you know, it's better to maybe invest in a General Electric um, and still yeah. get a little bit of that. Um, yeah. So, uh, be like that. So, uh, uh, you know, this this has been terrific. Uh, for you know, this has you know been a wonderful uh, time to to learn from you. And one of the things I love about Chapwood. Finance.com is we're really trying to give people a very deep inside uh, insight, excuse me, into what they should be doing with their money. And uh, my takeaway from this, as we conclude, is so I'm going to stay away from China. I mean, it's just that simple. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to be very nervous about different things. And uh, I hope that at some point in the near future, uh, I'll ask you to come back. That's for sure. And hopefully, you'll take okay. me up on it. So, uh, okay. everybody, uh, this has been Professor Paul uh, Tiffany from the Haas School. Of uh, you know at Berkeley, and uh, we've known each other a long time, and I really appreciate you taking the time, Paul. Okay, good to talk to you again.